and all the time. It is indeed good to be in the house of the Lord today. We could have been anywhere else, but we have decided by His grace to be in His house. Give yourselves a hand. Stop this one. Stop this one. Stop this one. Yes, it's mine. Yes, it's mine. As I was coming here, I was blessed to be reminded by my sister-in-law that I was going the wrong way. So I give God thanks that she is here with me. And I want to take the time now to recognize my family, my daughter, my wife, my sister-in-law, who is like my daughter. Give them a hand for always coming to church with me. I want to give recognition to the musicians. They did a fantastic job today. For their faithfulness, give them a hand. Our liturgist, Elder Christie, give her a hand as well. And I know that you already recognize yourselves, but you should all know. A lot of people, they are able to go to church, but they decide to stay home instead. And you are here. And I want you to know that God is pleased with what you have done. Amen? Amen. Amen. Last Sunday night, I had a great time preaching. And my, my brother was there to witness. He spoke about that night. And the reason why that night is so memorable is because I lost my voice for three days afterwards. <laughs> my voice didn't come back until Thursday afternoon. Because God took over and people were blessed. And I give him thanks that he saw this unworthy slave and decided to use him to bring his word to his people. Amen. I thank him for all of his blessings. I am like Paul when he said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, This grace was given to me to preach the unfathomable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. And grace is that which is given, which is not deserved. So every time someone stands here to preach, they ought to always remember that what they are doing is grace from God. Amen. Amen. I want us all to turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. This passage was read in your hearing. I also want to extend a thanks to the two ladies who read the scripture. I don't remember their names, but they know themselves. Amen? Amen. Amen. This passage of scripture, brethren, it chronicles for us the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Matthew, Luke, and John have their perspective on this event that took place. If you were to take all of the four Gospels and put them together to get the full picture of what took place at this historical event, you will see that Matthew 28, 1 through 15 says the same thing. Mark chapter 16, verse 1 to 8, which we read earlier. Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 35. And John chapter 1, verse 1 through 18. All of them speak about the same event in different ways without contradicting one another. And when you look at this, what you can find in those three Gospels are four points that I want us all to remember or I want us all to be aware of as we move on to hang your thoughts on. Point number one is going to be the certainty of the resurrection. Point number two is going to be the means of the resurrection. Point number three, the reason for the resurrection. And point number four, the appropriate response to the resurrection. We're going to be starting with point one, which is the certainty of the resurrection. When you look at Mark chapter one, verse seven, the Bible says, but go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. 
There you will see him, just as he told you. This passage, brethren, it reminds us of the words of Christ when he told his disciples what will take place in fulfillment of prophecy. And when we look at this as children of God and as followers of God, what this tells us as an applicative concept is this. What God says he will do, he does. Whatever God says he will accomplish, he accomplishes. In other words, God does not lie. In other words, God cannot lie. And the reason for that is because God is truth. And because God is truth, then God cannot do anything that contradicts his nature. And as a result, brethren, when we look at this particular passage and we read throughout the Gospels and we look at this theme, where did Jesus say that he will go and be crucified, be buried, and rise from the grave? We can find this in Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through 35, where Jesus says to his disciples, I am to go to Jerusalem. I am to be taken by the Gentiles. I am to be killed, and I am to be buried and rise on the third day. Many will look at this and say to themselves, how could Jesus Christ, as a man, know that this will take place? And is there a possibility for this not to take place and for this not to come to pass? Was there a possibility for the people of Israel, the Gentiles, and Judas who betrayed Jesus, was there a possibility for all of them to do otherwise? Was there a possibility for them to say, you know what, Jesus Christ is Lord, we are not going to crucify him, we are not going to put him to death, we love him and we are going to serve him. Was there a possibility? If the answer to this question is yes, then we believe that Jesus Christ was possibly wrong about what he said when he said that he will go to Jerusalem the Gentiles will take him, the Gentiles will murder him, and he will rise on the third day. And if that is true, then all of us will have to consistently apply this to everything else in Scripture. When God says he will provide for you, there is a possibility he will not provide for you. If the Bible says that God will feed you, there is a possibility God will not feed you. If the Bible says that God will heal you, there's a possibility that God will not heal you if you're following what I'm saying. If this concept of the resurrection, the concept of the death and the burial of Jesus Christ, if there was a possibility for these things not to take place, brethren, then we all have reason to doubt the words of God and the words of Christ. If we say that tomorrow, even though I don't have any money, I don't have any food, God will provide for me. And someone says, how do you know that? The Bible says. And then the person says, well, guess what? He could be wrong. There's a possibility God could be wrong about the future. There's a possibility you may not have food tomorrow. You may not have money tomorrow. You may not have healing tomorrow. But may I say this, brethren? The God that we serve is a truthful God. The God that we worship is a God that does what he says. The God that we worship is not like man who makes promises and then breaks them. The God that we worship, brethren, is a God that carries out all that he says he will carry out. Which means that we can all have hope. We can all have faith. And we can all trust in the God who says he will do something and he, tear, he carries it out. We can all be confident and know that even though things may not look good right now, our God is with us. Even though things may not be the way we want them to be, God is with us. Even though there are sometimes in church people may look down on us and bring us into places where we don't want to be and talk about us and bring us down, we know that we have a God who is on our side. A God who never fails. 
a God who never stumbles, a God who never slumbers, a God who never takes a break, but a God who says he will sustain you, he will provide for you, he will heal you, he will take care of you, and because he said it, he will bring it to pass. This is an amazing doctrine, brethren. That because Jesus said that, that this would take place, there was no possibility for it not to come to pass. And because of this, brethren, when I think about my life as a believer in God, and I think about all the promises that God has given me, and all the promises by extension that God has given to all of us, we all have reason to praise God. We all have reason to give Him thanks. Because every single one of us in this room can remember times in our life when we thought in our mind, maybe things are not going to turn out. Maybe things are not going to go in our favor. Maybe things are not going to go in regard to something that we can call good. But every single time, God came through for us. Every single time, God was the one who stood in the balance and brought to pass that which is good for you and for me. And this is amazing. Because Jesus said that he would rise from the grave. He rose from the grave. And I also want you all to remember what Jesus said in John chapter 2. Destroy this body, and in three days I will raise it up. And what Jesus said in John chapter 10, that no one takes my life from me, but I give it up on my own accord. And when you look at the crucifixion, brethren, no one could kill him, but rather he had to give up the ghost. No one took his life from him. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, was not a defeat on his part. It was not a win on the devil's part. It was not a win on the enemies of Christ's part. But rather, it was victory in the word of God. It was victory in the words of Christ. It was victory in him doing exactly what he said he would do. And by extension, brethren, because when you look at this, we know that God is in the business of rising people from death to life, which is our theme. He is the resurrection and the life. When we look at ourselves, brethren, and we remember that the Bible speaks about our former life when we were dead in sin and in transgression, but the grace of God saved us by drawing us out of death and giving us life so that we will live and live more abundantly. We have reason to say thank you, God, that you did not leave me in darkness. You did not leave me in sin. You did not leave me in my trouble and leave me in my affliction. But because you do all that you say, you will carry out. I am here today. I am alive and well. I have food on my table, clothes on my back, money in my bank account. And it is not because of me, but it is because of you and what you said you would do. Because our God does all that he says he will do. And the reason why we can have confidence in our God is because not only does God say he will do something, but he has the ability to carry it out. It doesn't matter how bad things look. It doesn't matter how bad things are. It doesn't matter how bad we feel inside. Our God never fails. Our God never falters. And our God is always the winner. Amen. Amen. And point two, brethren, I want to enlighten you on the fact of the means of the resurrection. When you look at John, well rather Mark chapter 16, just staying in the text, the Bible says, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. Brethren, the means of the resurrection is the crucifixion. Because I know that all of us will agree that Jesus Christ could not have risen from the dead unless he had died first. I know that all of us will agree that he had to die before he could be raised. He had to go into the grave before he could come out of the grave. 
just logically speaking. And when you look at this, brethren, what you find is that on Good Friday, when Jesus Christ was crucified, we call that day good because of what that accomplished. And many of us will look at this and in our minds when we imagine Jesus Christ on the cross after receiving the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet, after receiving the lashes of the whips that would pull flesh from bone, after screaming and having the thorn of a crown in his head. How can you look at all of that and say, it is good Friday? It is a very, very amazing answer to this question, brethren. Because when you look at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, the Bible says that all of the people that came against Jesus did exactly what God's hand and God's purpose predestined it to occur. And when you look at Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says it pleased God to crush him. It pleased God to put him to open shame. And when you think about this from the conclusion, you all understand that the crucifixion took place because of the hand of God and the plan of God. And the reason why we call this Good Friday is because of everything that God allows to take place is good. And let me tell you why. When we go back to the story of Joseph, Joseph's brothers stood before him. Joseph looked at his brother brothers and said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. When we think about this brethren and we look at our lives, every evil thing that takes place in our life is determined and decreed by God for good. That is why when we think about our enemies and we think about those who are against us and we think about those who don't like us, we like them, we love them, because if it wasn't for them, God could not bring us to where he wants us to be. That is why I can quote this verse with the psalmist. It was good that I was afflicted, that I may learn your word, brethren. When we go through trouble, when we go through trials, when we go through tribulation, when we go through affliction, every single one of those things take place because God wants them to take place to make you strong, to make you more faithful, to make you more joyful, to make you more loving, to make you more peaceful, because nothing that takes place in your life is out of the control of God. But because God is good, because God is holy, and because God is sovereign, He can bring about in your life, in my life, all that He wants to take place. And as a result, we can all look back at our lives and say, Thank you, God, for my enemies. Thank you, God, for my trouble. Thank you, God, for my affliction. Is there anybody in this room who can thank God for what He brought you through? Because if you did not go through what you went through, you would not have anything to thank God for. But because of His faithfulness, because of His decree, because of His providence, you have a reason to praise Him and give Him thanks for all. God is good. God is good, brethren, because when we think about our life, when we think about those processes, those times when we were going through it, when we're going through our problem, when we're going through our sickness, when we're going through our situations, it may feel good. It may feel right. And many times, brethren, we ask the question, why? Why? Why me? And we start to tell the Lord about all the things that we do. God, I go to church every Sunday. God, I throw my time. God, I witness to the lost. God, I read my Bible. God, I pray. Why is this happening to me? We can all remember the pains that we go through. Many of us may have lost a loved one. Many of us may have had a miscarriage. Many of us may have had times in our life where we had no job and we don't know where the money going to come from and we're sticking in our house, sitting down on our bed saying, I want me to let you know those times in our life, brethren, where we did not know how God was going to take us out of our situation. 
situation. I want to tell all of you now, brethren, that God predetermines, God decrees, God ordains that we go through all of this so that we can learn how to trust Him. Because now we can say, God was with me when I had no money. God was with me when I had no bread. God was with me when I was sick. God was with me when my enemies surrounded me. God was with me when I felt like I had no one around. God is faithful. And because of our experience with God and being faithful to us, we have reason to thank Him and give Him praise. Hallelujah. Nothing that takes place in our life is by accident. Nothing that takes place in our life is a surprise to God. Nothing that takes place in our life catches God off guard. Nothing happens in our life that makes God in heaven say, Oh God, many of us are going go, Oh Lord, Jesus, what are going on? We don't have a God who is worried. We don't have a God who is surprised. We don't have a God who has plan B's. But God has plan A's every time. Your entire life, as David said in Psalm 116, or rather 139, verse 16, all the days that are formed for me were formed by you, my God. Brother, when we think about this and we think about our days, we know that all of our days have been written by God. And all of our days have us coming out on the top. That is why the Bible says that God works all things after the counsel of his will. And why the Bible says that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So when we look at the death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, and we look at the most evil action that took place in the history of the human race. And then we look at the fact that God's hand was carrying out the crucifixion as the men who hated Christ, the men who were enemies of Christ, carried out exactly what God determined for them to carry out. When we look at our life, brother, there is nothing that we can go through that God does not have his hand in. And as a result, there is nothing that we go through that can give us a reason to worry about how things are going to turn out. Because God is faithful, and God does exactly what he says he will do. Amen. God is good. Yes. And point three, brother, I want to enlighten you on the reason for the resurrection. Reason number one, brethren, for the resurrection is because it is fulfillment of prophecy. Because God is not a liar, what he says will come to pass, will come to pass. And reason number two is our justification. That is why we look at Romans chapter 4, verse 25. The Bible says that he was delivered over for our transgressions. And he was raised because of our justification. Brethren, when you look at this doctrine of justification, what this is, is God essentially giving you the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ when you trust in him for salvation and grace. And as a result of this, brethren, when God looks at you, when God looks at me, he sees the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we may become the righteousness of God in him. This is reason for us to give God praise, brethren. Because if it had not been for his justification, we would all be on our way to hell. If it had not been for his righteousness being given to us, we would all be on our way to hell after we die. But because of his goodness, because of his grace, because of his mercy, when he rose from the grave, he had you on his mind. He had me on his mind. And that's why the songwriter said, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Amen. 
Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all my fears are gone. Because God is good, we have a reason to give him thanks. We are justified. We are righteous. We are holy in the eyes of God. But we must never think to ourselves that this righteousness and this holiness has been earned by us. But rather, we should always know that this righteousness, this holiness, is that which God has earned for us. And as a result, God can give that to us. But we all know of those who forget this truth. They forget this concept. They forget that their righteousness was not earned by them. And as a result, they come to church and they feel as though they are the holiest people in the room. They come to church and they feel as though they are the most righteous in a church. They come to church and they think to themselves, they must get the recognition. They must get the recognition because if they recognize me, they are all them. They think as though they are high and above everybody else. But I want to say that even the pastor who stands up here to preach, and you are equal in the eyes of God because of his righteousness that has been given to you. Amen, brother. I want to say that because of this reality of those who think that they are out of place, and think that they are righteous and they are the gem of the church. And if they are not there in church, the church would not survive. I want to say about these people as well, that because of the way they think, I don't know that anybody can touch them. I don't know that anybody can come up to them and say good morning. Because when you go up to them and say good morning, they look at you as though you can't talk to them. They look at you as though you can't say nothing to them. They look at you as though you don't get out of my class or my category. I will not do. They look at you as though they are high and mighty. And let me say something that I hope doesn't get me in trouble. Sometimes they pass on them with the same thing. When you go to them or you talk to them, they look by you and you can't talk to them. They call them on their phone and I can't hear the frustration. I will not want no. You call them up and say, God, we need some help. And the pastor was supposed to help you turn it on. How he can help you he turn it on? And brethren, as well, when you look at this concept of the self-righteousness of those in church, sometimes just to be polite, they say, how are you doing? But they don't hear who you are. Oh my goodness. You come to church and they shake your hand and say, How are you this morning? They look here. What are you doing? They're just saying it as a polite gesture. Because if they ever tell them, none of the things not going so well right now, they touch up their shoulder and say, God, go with you. Not true. Not true. Oh my goodness. You know, so sometimes we don't want to talk about it. No, we talk about ourselves. Yeah, we are very, very next, so we can't get in trouble yet. When you think about this, brethren, there are those in church because of their accolades, because of their position, because of their role in church, they forget who gave them righteousness in the first place. They forget that if it was not for God, they would not have been where they are. They forget that if it was not for the grace of God, they would not be saved. But we are not like them. We are saved with all of the true saints. Because of the righteousness of God, we are righteous. Because of the grace of God, we are saved. Because of the resurrection of God, we are justified. I will never look upon nobody in a church. Because everybody in church are on the same level. The musician and me are on the same level. The people in the pew and me are on the same level. The liturgists and me are on the same level. Because we all have the same righteousness. The same God. The same perfection. The same holiness. And those who can't see that, I call them to repentance. Glory to the name of God.
Glory to the King. This is the reality in church. An unfortunate reality. And sometimes we think that we earned our salvation. Sometimes we think God did an office with me. Sometimes we think God did an office. Bring me over the mountains. Sometimes we think that if anybody go to my heaven, I must see. Sometimes we think, brethren, if anybody go to my heaven, I must see. Sometimes we say to ourselves, did I miss heaven? And we say this to ourselves with a self-righteous gesture. Instead of saying, did not miss heaven because of the grace of God. All we say is, me, now I miss heaven. Oh, well, that because you dress nice around me and I miss heaven. Because you smell nice around me and I miss heaven. Because you wear nice and shoes around me and I miss heaven. Sometimes we think that our position in life makes us holy, makes us righteous, makes us good in the eyes of God. And all the work that we do for the kingdom makes us somehow better than everybody else. But let me tell you something. In a matter where you do in our life, in a matter who you is in life, you are not better than anybody in the kingdom. But we all stand equal at the throne of grace. The same God that saved you is the same God that saved me. And the same God that you have to bow down on your knees to pray to is the same God I got to bow down on my knees to pray to. The same God that we all got to humble ourselves when we come into his presence. But unfortunately, brethren, sometimes we forget that we are the creature and God is the creator. And as a result, we don't feel like we, we need to dirt up the clothes. I'm praying to God. We don't feel like we need to dirt up with ease. I'm praying to God. We don't think we have to humble ourselves and pray to God. Sometimes we think to ourselves, look how much things we live for God. There's a most of the God cut up, I'm praying to him, no. There's a most of the God cut up, I show me him, no. Look how much things God. And many preachers think to themselves, look at what sermon they preach. Look at what church they want to bring at church. Look at what people they baptize. Me now to go before God, I'll be humble no more. Because God used me in a special. But let me tell you something, brethren. The same person you put down in a lot of Africa, you and him are the same level in the eyes of God. Because God is not a God of partiality. He don't treat you better because of who you are. He treats you in accordance to what he says he will do. That is why we have life. That is why we have breath. That is why we have food on our table, clothes on our back. And sometimes because God is a little bit spiteful. He gives a close for your back, have food by your table in the presence of your enemies. Amen. No mm. time we think that he's spiteful. God, I'm not spiteful here because when when the people that think so, they bring it on. When the people that think so, they win. When the people that think so, they now come back at church and they see at church, they're surprised. Then I wonder, it may work. The plans against them may work. The older man and the older woman, when they go to the bring it on, it may work because you're still there at church. I am praise God to the resurrection. You're praising God that He died for you and He rose from the grave. You're praising God that because of Him you are alive. You're praising God that because of Him you have all that you have. Because of Him you have reason to give Him glory, honor, and praise. Brethren, we don't know how much people are surprised in your life. We don't know how much people we surprise by just being alive. We have no idea how many people we have surprised just by getting up every morning and going to church. Amen. Because if you think everybody like you, ah. you tell us something, brother. Oh my God. Be young enough to tell us that. I know everybody like you. Eh? No, no, I know everybody like you. Yes. <laughs> I know everybody like you, brother. If you can feel bad, never say it again because when I come to make you feel good, I don't know what I like you. Oh God. Let me say it again. I don't know what I like you. 
But God, I think you need to sink deep. Sometimes, brethren, I come at church and people smile in your face when they're like one bone on the ground. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, God, the camera. <laughs> they come to church, brethren, and they give it the nicest smile to the point of go over and say, the top two are here, say, honey. They get a smile to hear about the nicest smile to see from a morning. I hear a nose with a personal smile on your face. I'm <laughs> like, don't go boy. They go straight back to the yard and say, you see that one day? But I like it, man. 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 When they go in cussing groups and they start talking with your the names. There's a Jamaican brother that goes like this. When I see somebody has talk about you, tomorrow can't talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> so old doctrine, my brother. Oh, God. <laughs> Some of you can't talk about you because they can't talk to you. A little bit more of true, my brother. It's even true. Some of you can't talk about you. But let me move on to my fourth point because I don't want to keep you long. I don't want to keep you long. I'm not a long preacher, right? I want to get in and get out, as all they say. Point number four, brethren, is the appropriate response to the resurrection. The appropriate response to the resurrection. And we find this in the resurrection narrative of Matthew. When Matthew said, in his gospel, to all who would read, after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he said that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says, therefore, go into all the world and disciple the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This, brethren, gives us two things that we need to do as a response to the resurrection. Number one, we have to praise God for what he has done for us. And number two, we have to be obedient to the God that we say we serve. We have to be submissive to the Lord that we say we serve. Because brethren, nothing turn off the outside of superstiality than a hypocrite. In the I'm gonna say it again because sometimes we we don't get it. Sometimes we gotta say it twice. The hypocrite them in our church turn off the old sign as them. It's only God who knows when I turn on and can't even touch you. I'm not a reverend yet, so I have to be careful what I say. But I can say this again because I'm not lying out here. The hypocrite them in a church when they fear the Christian life. And then when they left church, they gone back in the club. They gone back in the dance hall. They gone back by the corner. Can dig on their hand they go. They gone back, can sleep with somebody who in a married to. They gone back in their sin. And then they come to church and praise God. Like they the never run. But God is in heaven saying, we knew we were last night. We knew we were in there last night. I we knew who we were in there with last night. I'm brethren, brethren, brethren. This very important response to the resurrection, which is obedience. We have disobedience, flagrant disobedience, open disobedience, taking place in the lives of those who call themselves Christians. And they come at church and say, I'm quiet. They come at church. And they have the nicest voice. So the pastor and the leaders will never dare say to them, you know, say, I can't say this man. They say, you yeah, know, so she hasn't been a sin, but she saw her good, so we can't make sure we're in a church and we sing. Oh, my goodness. And I'll tell you Sometimes, brethren, there are people who know that the pastor is living in sin and because he can't preach good. No, man, the people that go preach, man, they don't know where they're going to be like. 
When he preached, he bring down the Holy Spirit. When he preached, he bring down the house. Make him preach. When the Lord will be alive, brethren, we have to live in accordance with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must live in accordance with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The child said, you Christian, I live like a wicked sinner. A response to the resurrection is obedience to the King, obedience to our Lord, obedience to our Savior. It cannot be that you are living in sin, open sin, and you are serving in church, carrying the tithe basket, wiping the seats in the church, standing on the pulpit and preaching, sitting in the choir and singing, and as soon as Monday morning comes, the God straight up in a sin. These things are not be because we serve a Lord who is the true God, who is the true Savior, and it is His words that says, why do you call me Lord and do not do what I say? This is hypocrisy. This, my brethren, is hypocrisy. And not only this, but earlier I mentioned those who are self-righteous, those who are self-holy, those who are self-perfect. When they come to church, there are a category of people that they don't want to come near them, that they don't want to touch them, that they don't want to talk to them. And it is not those who are Christians. It is those who are not Christians. So when the non-Christians then come to church, you feel as though, because you are a Christian, because you are saved and anointed by the power of God, you're not have to talk to them. You know how they help them when the liturgy says, go and help somebody. Go and greet somebody. You only greet who you know. But it's who you don't know and go near them. And you don't know what the sinners are saying when they go back to their groups. You don't know what they are saying. Hey, we go to church last week Sunday. I used to the church Monday right there, so. We go to church last week Sunday. I used to the church sister the right there, so. We go to our believer and the woman scan me. And now go back. And as a result, we find ourselves in situations where because of our behavior in church, we turn away people who would come to church, people who planned last week, said they don't go to church Sunday morning, but because of the wicked church people then, they change their mind. We call them church people because they can Go to church and be a part of the church. You can go to church and not be a part of the church. You can proclaim to be a part of the kingdom and not be a part of the kingdom. So I bring these things to you, brethren, as the first response. Your response to what Jesus did for you on that cross is obedience to the king. Obedience to the Lord. Obedience to the Savior. And not because of what you think you have done that he has saved you, but rather because of his grace and his mercy, you are saved. And finally, brethren, the other response is praise. When you look at this word praise, brethren, and we try to find a biblical definition, when you go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says, offer up a sacrifice of praise to the Lord, which is the sacrifice of lips that give thanks to his name. Which means, brethren, when you come to church and you simply tell God, thank you for what you have done. That is you sending up your praises to God. But there is an indictment that I want to bring to our attention. And it is this. Sometimes we come to church not so that we can thank God for what he has done, but so that we can get something from him. And we plan to go to church. We plan to praise God. And we say to ourselves, I'm going to praise him for the mansion. I'm going to praise him for the Mercedes Benz. I'm going to praise him for the health and wealth. I'm going to praise him for the prosperity and goodness. Without thinking for one moment, I'm going to thank God for what he has done for me. And thank God for what I have in my life and not for what I don't have. We think to ourselves, 
ourselves because we don't receive what we went to church and praise to God for, that God must surreal. God must lay in heaven. God must gift or something because last I checked, I went to church and I praised him for a car and I'll know I don't have it yet. Last time I checked, I went to church and I praised him for a house and I don't know I don't have it yet. God must gift or something. But brethren, this is the wrong perspective. You don't go to church to see what you can get from God. You go to church to see what you can give to God. And all you can give to God, brethren, is your praise. It's your thanksgiving. And this is why we should all say thank you, God, for all that you have done. Is there anybody here who has a reason to thank God for what he has done? To thank God for the good things he has brought you through. To thank God for all the blessings that he has given you. To thank God that he rose from the grave so that you could be saved. Give the Lord. In closing, brethren, in closing, I want to say that we ought to thank God for what He has done. We are to remember that what God says He will do, He does. And this gives us a reason to trust in what God says in His Word. And because of this reality, there is no doubt in our mind that what God says He will do, He will take it out and bring it to pass. And what we also, also remember is this, brethren, that the means of the resurrection is the death of Christ in that Christ gave himself for all the sins of all those who would ever believe. And as a result of that, he could rise from the grave for your justification, for my justification. And we should never think to ourselves that we are holy because of what we have done, but rather because of what God has done. Amen. We should also remember the reason for the resurrection, and that is to save us from our sins and to show that God does exactly what he says he will do. And finally, our response to the resurrection is that we must be obedient to God. We must be obedient to our King. And finally, brethren, we must always remember that when we come to church, it is to thank God for what he has done and not to see what we can get from him. Amen. 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 Thank you all for your time. God bless you. Yeah, thank you God. This morning we stand and sing this little song before we go to the close.